At the end of the second segment on general relativity, I pointed out that Einstein's prediction that accelerating masses can create gravitational waves had yet to be discovered. As soon as I released the book, they were discovered. So I have added this chapter to the video book to go into gravitational waves, what they are, what is a ripple in space-time, what creates them, what can create a gravitational wave large enough for us to detect, and how did we actually detect it. Now we used interferometers, the Michelson interferometer, to actually detect the first gravitational wave. I'll end by discussing the impact on cosmology that the discovery of gravitational waves means. But first, what is a ripple in space-time? Our first step is to examine just what a ripple in space-time means. Here, on Earth, far from an event that could create a gravitational wave, we have a relatively flat space with a Euclidean metric, g, that isn't changing with time. A ripple represents small deviations from this flat space-time metric. We use h to represent these deviations. Solutions to Einstein's equations show that a gravitational wave's metric oscillates sinusoidally, just like light, and it travels at the same speed as light. As a wave moves down the z-axis, planes at different times experience different values for the metric used to measure distance on the plane. This makes the wave a transverse wave, just like light. We see two possible polarizations for a gravitational wave. We call one H plus for the action along the X and Y axes. We call the other H cross for action along the diagonal. This is again much like electromagnetic wave polarizations, except that these two polarizations are 45 degrees apart and EM wave polarizations are 90 degrees apart. To see what an oscillating H plus metric does, we'll measure the changes in the distance between two points on the plane when a gravitational wave passes. Here we have an XY plane with the wave passing into the page. We mark two points on the x-axis, one meter apart, in Euclidean flat space, where h is zero. When h is greater than zero, the distance between the two points on the x-axis become longer than one meter, by an amount equal to h times the original distance. At the same time, a one meter distance on the y-axis will shrink to less than one meter by the same amount. When h returns to zero, the distance between these points returns to one meter. When h is less than zero, the distance between the two points on the x-axis will become shorter than one meter, and the distance between the two points on the y-axis will become longer than one meter. Here's an exaggerated look at what an oscillating h plus polarized gravitational wave does to a square plate it passes through. Again, the wave is passing into the page. For an H-cross polarized wave, the effect would be similar, but shifted 45 degrees. When describing a gravitational wave, we can now be more precise than it's a ripple in space-time. A gravitational wave is an oscillating polarized metric that operates in the plane perpendicular to the direction of the wave as it moves through space at the speed of light. And we have seen what this means for the objects that encounter such a wave. They are stretched and squeezed in various directions. Here's one of the ways to create a significant gravitational wave. It's a binary star system with two masses revolving in a circular orbit around a common center of gravity. The star's acceleration creates gravitational waves that travel out from the system in all directions 
just like the light waves they are generating. The gravitational wave solutions show that the frequency of the created gravitational wave is twice the rotation rate of the binary system. To understand the factors involved in the generation of the two polarizations and their amplitudes, we have constructed a coordinate system with its center at the center of the orbital motion in the orbital plane. The amplitude of the gravitational wave depends on the masses of the two objects and the distance between them. In addition, we need to consider the angular rotation and the viewing angle to determine the strength of each polarity at any point in time. There is one more key factor to consider when it comes to binary systems, namely that the gravitational waves carry energy and momentum away from the system. We call this gravitational luminosity. Newton and Kepler provided the mechanics for understanding what happens to the orbit when gravitational energy is lost. Because binding energy is negative, a loss of energy will make it a larger negative. This has the effect of reducing the distance between the two objects. This, in turn, increases their velocity. A shorter circumference and faster velocity reduces the time it takes for a full orbit and therefore increases the frequency of rotation and therefore the frequency of the gravitational wave. And the wave equations show that the amplitude of the gravitational wave will increase with the frequency. The rate that the frequency is changing is called the chirp. It gives us the ability to express the amplitude of the gravitational wave in terms of the frequency and the rate the frequency is changing, instead of the masses and the distance between the masses. This is crucial because for most cases we will have no way of knowing directly what the masses are or how far apart they are but measuring the frequencies might be possible. If we can also measure the amplitude, we can even calculate the distance to the binary system. Because this distance is based on gravitational wave luminosity, it is called the luminosity distance. For most all gravitational wave sources, this will be the only way to figure out how far away they are. With a decaying orbit, the objects will eventually collide and coalesce. We can even calculate how long that would take. The resulting waveform, called a coalescing waveform, serves as a signature for this kind of gravitational wave source. It has three phases. The in-spiral, the merger, and the ring down to an object that is no longer asymmetric and therefore no longer radiating gravitational waves. To get an idea on the expected amplitudes and frequencies for gravitational waves created by a system like this one, let's put in some numbers. Suppose this system is 100 light years away and each star is the mass and size of our Sun. And the distance between them is 50 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. That's 50 astronomical units. From the masses and the distance between them, we can calculate the star's orbital period. And with that, we can calculate the orbital frequency, which gives us the frequency and wavelength of the resulting gravitational wave. And with the masses and frequency, we can calculate the amplitude of the resulting gravitational wave. Here we have a very small number it would add around a hundredth of the diameter of an electron to a meter stick. What's more, it would take over 62 years to reach this minuscule stretched length. Not only that, it will take trillions of years to merger. Should this system ever reach the point where it is close to merging, we'd get the maximum gravitational wave amplitude we find that the distance between their centers of mass is still way too large to produce a significant amplitude. 
This one is approximately the ratio of the width of a human hair to the distance to Alpha Centauri, four light years away. Here is where this data point fits on a graph with wavelength decreasing along the x-axis and amplitude increasing along the y-axis. Binary systems like this one are plentiful and all around us. There are literally billions of them sending gravitational waves our way from every direction. But the gravitational waves they create are weak and totally indistinguishable from one another. They just wind up contributing to a background noise level. In our sensitivity graph, we see that in order to detect a gravitational wave, a binary system will have to create waves with greater amplitudes and higher frequencies to generate smaller wavelengths than the noise level marked in green. To stand out, a binary system is needed that can achieve much higher velocities. And as we have seen from our example, the large diameters of stars prevents them from ever getting close enough to reach the needed velocities. But rotating neutron stars might be small enough to achieve the needed speed. Here's a system with two equal mass neutron stars that have reached the point where they are whirling around each other 10,000 times a second. The stars merge in a few milliseconds, sending out a burst of gravitational waves and a brief intense gamma ray burst. You can see the three phases, the in spiral, the coalescence or merger, and the ring down to an object, most likely a Kerr black hole, that is no longer asymmetric and therefore no longer radiating gravitational waves. If we fed the waveform into an audio generator, it would sound like this. We call it the chirp. The mass of a typical neutron star is 1.5 times the mass of the Sun, with a radius of only 10 kilometers. If the system is 33,000 light years away, an average distance for a Milky Way object, it would give us a theoretically detectable wavelength and amplitude. Here we mark its position on the gravitational wave sensitivity graph. But coalescing neutron stars are not common events. Astronomers estimate that there might be one of these neutron star mergers every 50 years inside the Milky Way. To get a higher rate, we have to move outside of the galaxy into the Virgo supercluster, our local supercluster that we covered in the How Far Away Is It video book. Within a 50 million light year radius, we expect to have as many as 10 or more neutron star mergers per year because we're including thousands of galaxies. Unfortunately, at this extended distance, the amplitude drops to the 10 to the minus 21 range. In fact, as we look beyond 50 million light years, the neutron star merger amplitudes drop below 10 to the minus 24 range, making them undetectable. If we're going to find detectable gravitational waves beyond this distance, we're going to need objects much more massive than neutron stars. For that, we'll need to involve black holes. Here we have a black hole merger simulation. We'll start with stellar mass black holes that run from 3 to 50 times the mass of our Sun. In this example, each black hole has 25 times the mass of the Sun and they are in orbit 50 million light years away in the Virgo supercluster. The minimum distance between them will be twice their Schwarzschild radius, which is larger than a neutron star radius. This puts them further apart than the earlier merging neutron stars example, but the increase in the black hole's mass more than compensates for that, and the merger produces a much larger amplitude. Now suppose these were two supermassive black holes, with each having 10 billion times the mass of the Sun. The Schwarzschild radius would become 40 million times larger. The gravitational wave's wavelength would be 36 million times longer. And the wave's amplitude, 
would be two million times greater. In addition, calculating the circumference of the orbit and dividing by the period, we see that these behemoths are traveling around each other at up to one-third the speed of light. But black holes this massive in circular orbits might never actually merge. Although merging galaxies with black holes at their centers will have their black holes sink to the center of the new merged galaxy, they may not get close enough to form a new single black hole. This is the case because by the time the black holes reach a separation distance of around one parsec or 3.2 light years, the time to merger equation shows that this one will take over 333 billion years. That's 24 times the age of the universe. Astronomers call this the parsec problem. Yet, the supermassive black holes Sagittarius A-star and Andromeda A-star are not binary systems. Putting things into perspective, equal mass, supermassive black holes in a circular orbit would be rare. Elliptical orbits with different masses in varying environments are the norm, and this can dramatically change the time to merge. Here's the recently merged galaxy NGC 6240. It has two supermassive black holes orbiting each other 2,240 light years apart. That's 750 parsecs. They are orbiting in a sea of molecular gas with a mass of around 9 billion times the mass of our Sun, as measured by the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in northern Chile. Based on stellar dynamics, one is up to 9.7 times 10 to the seventh solar masses. The other is up to 4.4 times 10 to the eighth solar masses. Taking all this into account, researchers calculated that the supermassive black holes will merge around 55 million years from now. Here's our gravitational wave sensitivity graph. I've included several of our equal mass merger examples, and I've added the frequencies that correspond to the wavelengths in order to highlight the gravitational wave spectrum. Also, note the expanse covered by the two axes. The strain is always a small number, but the top value of 10 to the minus 6 is a billion trillion times larger than the lower value of 10 to the minus 24 and the wavelength goes from a thousand meters on the far right up to the diameter of the visible universe on the left. This large extreme covers the gravitational waves created at the time of the Big Bang. They have been stretched by the expansion of the universe for over 13 billion years. Here's the range for supermassive black hole mergers. They produce a huge burst of gravitational waves at millihertz frequencies, detectable throughout most of the known universe. Here's the range for supermassive black hole mergers with stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. Here's the range for stellar mass black hole mergers with stellar mass black holes and neutron stars. Here's the range for stellar mass black hole mergers with stars Here's the range for white dwarf mergers. These would only be detectable if they happen in our galaxy. And here's the range for rapidly spinning neutron stars with an uneven mass distribution. It's the angular acceleration of uneven mass components, such as a mountain on the surface, that produces the detectable gravitational waves. The green area above the detectability line is for the millions of non-merging supermassive black hole binaries in galaxy centers. They create theoretically detectable gravitational waves, but there are too many of them to distinguish one wave from another. This makes their individual signals unresolvable. At the lower end, this would include non-merging binary white dwarf stars in the Milky Way. We'll now turn our attention to how we can go about detecting these waves. In 1974, 58 years after Einstein predicted the existence of gravitational waves, two radio astronomers, Joe Taylor and Russell Holtz, were looking for new pulsars 
using the 305-meter Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico. They found one. It's named PSR B1913-16, and it led to the first indirect verification of Einstein's prediction. You'll recall from the Globular Clusters and Supernova chapter in the How Far Away Is It video book that a pulsar is a rapidly rotating neutron star with a powerful magnetic field. The result is a sort of magnetic lighthouse, which, if aligned correctly, flashes in our direction twice each cycle. These signals are highly regular. In fact, pulsars are some of the best clocks in nature and this allows extremely precise measurements of their motion. This one was pulsing every 59 milliseconds, indicating that the pulsar rotates 17 times per second. But Hulse and Taylor noticed that the pulsars varied regularly every 7 and 3 quarters hours, with pulses arriving 3 seconds earlier at some times relative to others. This meant that the pulsar was in an elliptical orbit with another neutron star. This was the first binary neutron star ever discovered. Using the orbital motion, they calculated the star's masses, their closest approach, called a perestron, and their furthest distance apart, called the apostron, as well as the system's inclination. With this information and the gravitational wave equations, they were able to calculate the amount of gravitational radiation, the expected decay of the orbit due to the lost gravitational energy, and the corresponding reduction in the time it takes per orbit. This graph maps the accumulated reduction in orbital periods against time, assuming that Einstein's equations are correct. Hulse, Taylor, and others have studied this binary system for 40 years now. This graph records their measurements. We see that the measurements fit the theory perfectly. This gave scientists confidence that Einstein's gravitational waves do indeed exist. Direct detection of gravitational waves is tricky for two main reasons. One is that the amplitude of the waves are so small, and the other is that the measuring sticks you might use to measure a change in length are changed themselves. In other words, the changed length will still read out as one meter. But the stretching and squeezing does put a strain on the plate, and that can be measured with an attached wire that acts as a resistor. It's called a strain gauge. If we attach wires along the plate, instead of a meter stick, we can measure changes in the resistance of the wire as it is stretched and squeezed. A longer, thinner wire will provide more resistance to an electric current, and a shorter, fatter wire will provide less resistance to an electric current, thus giving us a measure of the strain. Unfortunately, this technique is literally millions of times too insensitive to measure the tiny gravitational wave amplitudes, H, but this technique is why we call H a measure of strain. Michelson interferometers look like the best chance to detect these waves. You recall that we covered the interferometers in the first chapter of this video book. The arms on that one were 11 meters long, and its sensitivity was nowhere near what is needed for gravitational waves. Today we have LIGO, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. In 2015, it started with two identical interferometers, 3,000 kilometers apart. That's 1,864 miles. With one near Hartford, Washington, and the other near Livingston, Louisiana. Here are the L-shaped LIGO instrument components. It has a powerful near-infrared laser with an output after amplification that reaches 200 watts of 1064 nanometer light. The beam splitter and mirrors that act as test masses are 40 kilogram objects 
suspended by a fused silica glass fibers to minimize noise due to vibrations. Additional internal and external active vibration minimization technologies eliminate the effects of everything from nearby traffic to lunar tidal forces. The 4-kilometer arms are 10,000 cubic centimeters of ultra-high vacuum, equal to one trillionth of an atmosphere. In addition, each arm contains reflective mirrors that route the light back and forth inside the arms 280 times before it hits the exits for recombination. The photodetector is a state-of-the-art indium gallium arsenide photodiode array with a high quantum efficiency designed to detect extremely small amounts of light at a wavelength of 1064 nanometers. The laser light is split and sent to the two mirrors. On return, they are recombined and sent to the photodetector. The beams returning from the two arms are kept out of phase, so that when the arms are both in sync, as when there is no gravitational wave passing through, their light waves subtract and no light arrives at the photodetector. When a gravitational wave passes through the interferometer, the distance along the arms of the interferometer are shortened and lengthened, causing the beams to become slightly out of sync. Hence, some light arrives at the photodetector, indicating a signal. Given LIGO's extra 280 passes through the tube, a gravitational wave strain amplitude of 10 to the minus 21 would displace the mirrors by 10 to the minus 18th meters. That's one thousandth the diameter of a proton. Here's our sensitivity graph. And here's the sensitivity line for the current LIGO capabilities. All gravitational waves with strains below the curve are undetectable. The curve shows that LIGO can detect gravitational waves with wavelengths between 10 to the 3rd and 10 to the 9th meters. With the maximum sensitivity enabling detections with strains as small as 10 to the minus 22, when the wavelengths are between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 7th meters. This is a range where powerful binary system mergers of stellar mass black holes and neutron stars within the Virgo supercluster our local supercluster, should be detectable. At 9, 50, and 45 seconds, coordinated universal time, on the 14th of September, 2015, a signal was detected by the LIGO detector in Livingston and 6.9 milliseconds later in Hanford. It was a chirp signal that lasted just over two-tenths of a second. When we route the wave into a sound generator, here's what it sounds like. This plot combines the data from both sites. The waveform is consistent with coalescing masses with a 10 cycle, 200 millisecond in spiral that gives us the frequency, the rate of change of the frequency and a peak wave amplitude. A merger that takes around two milliseconds. And a ring down as the coalesced objects cease to radiate gravitational energy. Detector noise introduces errors into all the calculations based on these figures. That's why we'll provide a range for each item. The amplitude and frequency data points give us the luminosity distance. It is important to note that gravitational waves experience redshifting as they travel across the cosmos, just like light does. Having traveled around a billion light years, this wave would have experienced a redshift near 0.1. So the frequency we see here is a bit smaller than the frequency at the start of the wave's journey here. The frequency data also gives us the chirp mass. Taking the redshift information gleamed from the merger and ring down portions of the waveform, we get the binary system masses. These masses are too large for neutron stars that are only a few times the mass of the Sun. 
So we must be witnessing the merger of two large stellar black holes. During the last 200 milliseconds of their in-spiral, the orbiting velocity of the black holes increased from 30% the speed of light to 60% of the speed of light. Over the same period, the distance between the two black holes went from around 1,000 kilometers to just under 200 kilometers when their event horizons made contact. Modeling the final ring down shows that the mass of the resulting Kerr black hole is around 62 solar masses. That's three solar masses less than the sum of the masses of the two inspiraling black holes. This mass was converted to the radiated gravitational energy. In other words, during the final 20 milliseconds of the merger, the power of the radiated gravitational waves peaked at about 3.6 times 10 to the 49th watts. Let's take a second to get a feel for how large this number is. In our How Far Away Is It segment on nearby stars, we found that the Sun converts 4.26 million metric tons of matter into energy every second. The resulting power output is equal to 4 billion hydrogen bombs exploding every second. The Sun is an average star, so we can use this as an average stellar power output. From our segment on local superclusters, we saw that there are 250,000 trillion stars within 1 billion light years. This represented around 7% of the total number of stars in the universe. We get the total power emitted by all the stars in the visible universe by multiplying the average watts per star times the number of stars. The power generated over the last 20 milliseconds by this merger of two stellar mass black holes is 26,000 times greater than the combined power of all the light radiated by all the stars in the universe over that same period of time. That's the signal we saw in September 2015, a billion years after it happened. Here's this event's place on the sensitivity graph. You can see that it's well within the sensitivity area covered by LIGO. We have used the wave information to find the energy, wavelengths and masses involved, as well as the distance to this event. But the wave information does not tell us in which direction it came from, because each interferometer is a whole sky monitor with very little directional information. But having two detectors does give us some directional data. For example, if the wave came in parallel to the line between the two sites, the signals would have registered at the exact same time. If the wave was perpendicular to the line, we would have seen a time delay of 10 milliseconds because the wave travels 3,002 kilometers through the Earth at the speed of light. What we detected was a wave that came in at an angle that caused a delay of 6.9 milliseconds. The dotted line represents the distance the wave had to travel for a piece of it to reach the Hanford interferometer. A little trigonometry gives us the angle. But with only two interferometers, this angle gives us a circle of possible directions, not the single direction that's needed. Now, there are four such gravitational wave interferometers. In addition to LIGO's two, there is Virgo, located in Cassina, a small town near Pisa, Italy, on the site of the European Gravitational Observatory, and Kagra, located under Mount Ikenoyama in Japan. Its test mass mirrors are cooled to cryogenic temperatures. All four work together to cross-check each other and pinpoint gravitational wave source sky locations. Combined, they have detected over 90 gravitational waves so far. In this graphic, each circle represents a different black hole in blue or neutron star in orange. The half blue, half orange circles are compact objects whose classification is uncertain. The vertical scale indicates the mass, 
as a multiple of the mass of our Sun. The arrows indicate which compact objects merged and the remnant they produced. We'll cover this one, the most massive, in the next segment. On May 21st, 2019, at 3.02 and 29 seconds, Coordinated Universal Time, Advanced LIGO and Advanced Virgo observed a short-duration gravitational wave signal, GW190521. The signal was of a shorter duration and peaked at lower frequency than any other binary black hole merger observed to date, indicating that it was going to be the most massive in-spiral ever detected. The in-spiral frequencies were so low that they were out of the sensitivity range for the LIGO detectors. Here's the chirp sound. Without the lead-in wave, and with a very low peak frequency, this sounds more like a thud than a chirp. As we found earlier, with the first gravitational wave, the frequency data gives us the masses of the merging black holes and is fed into numerical general relativity simulations to compute the remnant's mass. The analysis shows that the merger included two black holes with 85 solar masses and 66 solar masses. The calculated mass of the remnant is 142 solar masses. This, along with the strain amplitude, gives us the luminosity distance to the source at 17.3 billion light years. Note that the remnant mass is less than the combined masses of the two merging black holes by around nine solar masses. This mass difference was converted into the energy of the gravitational wave. That's almost triple the energy created by GW150914. In our chapter on black holes, we identified three types. Stellar mass, the smallest, supermassive, the largest, and intermediate mass black holes, IMBH for short, in between the other two, with a range from 100 to 100,000 times the mass of the Sun. We pointed out that, to date, there has not been a single confirmed discovery of a black hole in this range. So, with 142 solar masses, this event represents the first direct evidence of the existence of such objects. Here's where GW190521 fits on the sensitivity graph. All interferometers detect gravitational waves by measuring the change in distance between two arms as the wave passes through. The longer the arms, the greater the change. With shorter arm lengths, we get smaller length changes. At some point, noise levels will prevent wave detection. Current Earth-based interferometers have arms around 4 kilometers long. That's 2.5 miles. This length limits detector sensitivity to shorter wavelengths. Newer, larger Earth-based interferometers are in design and development. One is the Einstein Telescope. It will be underground with an arm length of 10 kilometers. That's 6.2 miles. Construction could begin as early as 2026 with the goal to start observations in 2035. Another is the Cosmic Explorer. Its design features 40 kilometer arms. That's 25 miles. This length will enable the detection of millions of gravitational waves per year. It is also planned for operation in the 2030s. There is one additional planned project for the 2030s. This one will create an interferometer in space called the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA for short. It will consist of three spacecraft arranged in a triangular formation that follows the Earth from the L1 Lagrange point. Each arm is 2.5 million kilometers long. That's 1.6 million miles. When gravitational waves pass through the triangle, they will produce oscillations in the lengths of its arms, and LISA will capture these changes. This is similar to LIGO, only a million times more sensitive. Here's its estimated coverage area on our sensitivity graph. If all goes well, LISA will provide our first look at signals from supermassive black hole mergers.
A totally different technique for detecting gravitational waves is to use pulsars with rotation rates greater than 100 times per second, called millisecond pulsars. Instead of using interferometers to measure the tiny changes in the length of an arm, it uses the variation in the time it takes for pulsar light to reach Earth. For example, suppose there's a pulsar 3,588 light years away with a pulse every two milliseconds. In this example, a supermassive black hole in spiral creates a gravitational wave that increases the time between pulses by two microseconds over six years. That's 600 meters, giving us a strain of 2 times 10 to the minus 16. One of the keys to the success of the method is the extremely accurate measurement of each pulse's arrival at the radio telescope, called the time of arrival, or TOA for short. Given the arrival time of one pulse, we would just add pulsar rotation time to calculate the expected time of arrival for the next pulse with a few adjustments for things like the Earth's rotation, the orbital motion of the Earth and the pulsar if it's in a binary system, the dispersion delay caused by electrons in the interstellar medium, and a few additional relativistic effect items. Differences between the actual time and the expected time are called residuals. For a steady state situation, we would see the average over time as a horizontal line but a very long period gravitational wave would continuously increase the proper distance traveled by a pulse over a long-term observation program. This plot shows the effect of an increase in travel time of two microseconds over six years. That's the 600 meters in this example. Of course, thorough analysis is needed to rule out other causes for a graph like this. For example, we would see this residuals pattern if instead of a gravitational wave, the pulsar's rotation rate was actually slowing down. Another way to find gravitational waves with pulsars is to use an array of them and measure the distances to and the viewing angles between all of them over time. That's enough to compute the distances between them as well. As gravitational waves pass through the array, we should see deviation patterns that are correlated across all the pulsars in the array. In recent years, a large number of radio wave observatories across the globe have formed teams to find gravitational wave patterns. The frequencies of the gravitational waves detected by the pulsar timing array teams are at the lower end of the frequency scale called nanohertz. A nanohertz gravitational wave is generated by massive objects that are far enough apart to take 15 years or more to make one orbit. To create enough strain to enable detection, these objects would have to be supermassive black holes, like those residing at the center of most galaxies. For example, consider the two supermassive black holes at the center of NGC 6240 that we covered earlier. It's 400 million light years away orbiting each other 2,240 light-years apart. One is 97 million times the mass of our Sun. The other is 440 million times the mass of our Sun. Calculating the period, frequency, wavelength, and strain, we see that the gravitational waves created are deep in the noise and undetectable. But by the time the distance between them is around 5,000 times the distance between the Earth and the Sun, we get detectable waves. These are the kinds of waves that the world's pulsar timing array projects are designed to detect. Here are the regions covered by pulsar timing and pulsar timing arrays on our sensitivity graph. The large number of gravitational waves detected so far by interferometers around the world implies that there could be a background of gravitational waves created by the superposition of numerous incoherent sources happening throughout the history of the universe. This would create a background, coming from all directions, with a pattern that can be analyzed statistically. Such a pattern is referred to as stochastic, and the radiation is referred to as the Stochastic Gravitational Wave Background, or SGWB for short. 
Here's a set of possible stochastic background maps that could happen as detection methods improve over time. For reference purposes, I've included the maps that actually did happen with the cosmic microwave background. The universe is currently separated into the observable, where light travels across space relatively uninhibited for us to collect and analyze, and the unobservable, where light could not travel far. The demarcation line is the surface of last scattering that created the CMB. But any gravitational waves created during the unobservable time would have traveled across space and might still be with us today as part of the stochastic background. For example, as we covered in the How Old Is It video book on the Lambda Cold Dark Matter Big Bang Theory, the universe began with an extremely short period of exponential expansion called inflation that produced a radiation-only universe that cooled into a quark plasma. The phase transition from radiation to a quark plasma is similar to water's phase transition from liquid to gas in boiling water. Note that phase transitions do not create gravitational waves. But transitions like inflation, baryogenesis, and nucleosynthesis would start out as growing bubbles of the new state material inside the old state material, like the gas bubbles in liquid water, keeping in mind that even small bubbles could contain a percentage of all the mass in the universe. Bubble collisions would generate massive gravitational waves. The search for the stochastic background is underway using very large numbers of pulsar timing arrays. Unlike the other gravitational wave signals, the stochastic background would just appear as noise in a single gravitational wave detector, assuming that the noise in each detector is statistically independent from one another, and because the time average for noise is zero, multiple detectors can factor it out. In 2023, pulsar timing array groups collectively announced that they have uncovered the first evidence for low-frequency gravitational waves permeating the cosmos. The next era of gravitational waves and cosmology has begun.